Amir Mashri, and I'm the director of the Center for Philosophy of Science at the University of Pittsburgh. Today, it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce my colleague in the Department of History and Philosophy of Science at the University of, Pig of uh, Pittsburgh, Ma Marianne Gilton, who is a philosopher of uh, physics working on uh, among other things, on particle physics. She has published extensively in the best journals in philosophy, such as PPR and Philosophy of Science. Today, Marianne is going to be talking about when counting counts, supporting a particle interpretation of particle physics. Um, today, it's my uh, great pleasure to uh, introduce my uh, also colleague, <laughs> Marianne uh, Gilton, who specializes in history of history and philosophy of uh, physics. She got her PhD from LPS Irvine a few years ago, but she's been uh, in the Department of History and Philosophy of Science for now a few years. She works in many areas in the philosophy of uh, physics, ranging from Newton and Aristotle to uh, uh, quantum field theory, to the uh, issues around the nature of particles and how to understand them. Um, uh, she has published in many journals, Philosophy of Science, PPR, and research some uh, paper, I don't know whether it's uh, accepted in philosophy of physics or it's still you know, at the INR stage. I don't want, I don't want to jinx, I don't want to jinx it. So uh, soon to be accepted. Uh, David, <laughs> David, is, David is the editor of the journals. <laughs> All right, uh, and but today she's going to be talking about where counting counts, supporting a particle interpretation of particle physics. Thank you, Edward, um, and thank you all for being here today. So we'd like to interpret quantum field theory, right? So quantum field theory is the mathematical framework in which we do particle physics. It's a nice, respectable philosophical project to go and try and interpret that framework theory. But what we should be clear here, what we really want to do is interpret interacting quantum field theory. So there are a couple different, so uh, when you do quantum field theory, you start with the easy case where you've got fields and they don't do anything. They just sit there. That's free quantum field theory. The interpretation of free quantum field theory is pretty straightforward. Not much happens, right? This is, this is the nature of, of free quantum field theory. But you start there, and once you've got a handle on it, you then go learn how to turn on the interactions. Now we've got these quantum fields. Let's have them interact with each other um, and have some actual interesting physical processes going on. So that's really the area of quantum field theory that we'd really like to interpret, right? It's, it's not just the free case. We've got to be able to understand what's going on in the inter interacting case. So the big question here in this, this area of the literature um, in philosophy of quantum field theory is this. Does interacting quantum field theory admit of a particle ontology? Can we move forward with our understanding of quantum field theory, this framework in which we do particle physics, in such a way that it makes sense or it's warranted to say that the entities out there in the world we're studying really are particles? And you might hope that the answer is yes, that particle physics really is particle physics. It's a place uh, where we're studying little tiny particles, right? Um, but very quickly, you start to wonder if maybe that's not right. So for example, maybe you're curious about, about particle physics and you go to CERN's website and you look up this basic information about the Higgs boson. And here's, here's what you find. You and everyone, uh, you and everything around you are made up of particles. But when the universe began, no particles had mass. They all sped through at the speed of light. Stars, planets, and light could only emerge because particles gained their mass from a fundamental field associated with the Higgs boson. The existence of this mass-giving field was confirmed in 2012 when the Higgs boson particle was discovered at CERN. All right, so I've highlighted this for you. Clearly, we've got talk of particles going on here in yellow. Um, but then this other notion of a field sneaks in. And so you might be wondering as you read through this, was the discovery in 2012 a discovery of a field or a discovery of a particle? Or both? Is there some more complicated relationship here of 
Well, at the fundamental level, what we have is a Higgs field, this sort of entity that's spread out through all of space time. And at a sort of emergent or in some other sense, less fundamental uh, level, we have individual Higgs boson particles and, and uh, we, have, we have a more complicated story of both. And so you might, at just at the initial stage of looking at certain websites, think that the, uh, the correct ontological story for our interpretation of quantum field theory might need to say more about fields and particles and figure out how they how they relate to each other. But why might you still really want to hold out hope that we should really be able to say yes to this big question? Yes, there are particles. Um, well, <clears throat> one important reason comes from where all this begins with the empirical evidence. So here's a standard picture of what's called a bubble chamber. Um, and so what you have here are ionization tracks of various charged particles going through this chamber. So the straightforward way of interpreting this empirical data is to say, well, these white tracks indicate where one individual particle once was, right? So they, some of them come in through kind of straight, Others kind of go off in these spirals, right? But what you're seeing there in this picture are the tracks of places through the chamber where one individual particle came through. This is the most natural sort of reading here. So if we're, we're worried uh, about what the correct ontology of the theory is, you might really hold out hope that it's going to line up with your most natural reading of the empirical evidence. You'd want what we say about experiment to align with what we say from the basis of the fundamental theory. All right. Um, now, it's really important to say from the outset here that we're in the realm of the quantum where things are already pretty weird. So when we're talking about particles, we've given up a lot of things already in this context that we might have wanted from a classical particle. So we've given up the idea of primitive thisness or hexaeities. That's not what we need for particles. We've very much already given up the idea that uh, particle interpretation would mean what's going on at this at this level is something like very, very tiny marbles. This isn't what we what we want. Instead, we want this very thin, minimal conception of what it would take to get a particle interpretation. And it's just these two things. Particles can be localized. Right, so as opposed to fields that are really spread out, particles better be the sort of thing that are just in one little tiny place. Really, really, really tiny, maybe even point-like. And then the second thing you really want for um, a particle interpretation is to say that these things can be counted and aggregated. You want to be able to say in a particular physical system, uh, not just that there are particles that make it up, but how many there are. Right? And if you've got one system made up of three particles and a second one made up of four particles and you put them together, you'd really like to be able to get the answer that that new combined system is made up of seven particles. You want them to aggregate. But everything else about classical particles, we give up. So it seems like this should be maybe a pretty low bar. We've got hope. Yes, we can get a particle uh, interpretation out of this. How hard can it be? It's just got to be localized and the sort of thing that you can do. <laughs> All right, but on both of these scores, there's a literature um, in uh, philosophy of um, <clears throat> physics raising pretty substantial technical concerns on both of these scores. So there's a um, whole set of arguments that we can't actually get localized particles. The localization piece has some problems. And then there's the second set, um, second sub sub literature on the issue of whether or not we can count and aggregate these things. And I'm going to focus today on um, Maureen Fraser's 2008 paper that raises a real problem for um, the piece about counting and aggregating in the case of interacting quantum field theory. <clears throat> so there's also this unreal effect that's relevant here. We'll set it aside for today and just focus on um, this argument from Doreen. But what, I, what I, we're going to focus on just the one argument, but I do want to highlight here that um, 
for the, the big question of can we get a particle interpretation, there are multiple lines of argument that lead to a pretty broad consensus in the philosophical literature that the answer is no. You cannot get a particle interpretation. There are um, several different lines of argumentation that raise pretty substantive problems that don't seem to be solvable. We're going to focus on just one of those today. Okay. <clears throat> I just want to just highlight at the outset here the degree to which um, authors in this area take the ultimate conclusion to be about the world, about the world. So here's Hans Tolverson and Bob Clifton. They say, uh, QFT does not permit an ontology of localized particles, and so strictly speaking, our talk about localized particles is a fiction. We mean this very seriously, that when we say particle in any part of our parlance and, and physics, strictly speaking, that's not true. And similarly, Doreen has a, a strong line here. Q of T does not support the inclusion of particles in our ontology. Okay, this is really, uh, elsewhere there she, in the paper, she says, there, there are no, no particles in the world. This is the final conclusion from this argument. We're not just staying at the, the level of making some statement about what goes on in the theory, we're moving from there to claims about the world. Okay. So the, the picture at this point is, is something like this. I made for you this little structure of a house, a little house to represent, um, to give us a way of keeping out, separating out three different areas uh, of relevant science in particle physics that matter for this discussion. <clears throat> so it looks like um, up here in the realm of experiment and then the actual modeling procedures, the standard model of particle physics, it really looks like we're talking about particles all the time. But then down here, if the philosophers are right, down here in the foundations of quantum field theory, we've got reason to say, nope, there aren't any particles. And so it looks like we've got this disagreement between what we can do down here at the foundations, the broad theoretical framework in which we do any of this science. We've got this disagreement between the foundations and the rest of the scientific achievement, both at the theoretical level of the standard model and at the experimental level of things that go on at CERN. Okay. And so if you right, if you accept this consensus, um, then you're uh, forced to accept that there is this gap between the two. And then you, it's incumbent upon you to sort of fill in that gap. Give me a story that explains um, how it is that this is still a good foundation for this area of physics if they seem to disagree on the face of it about what even the entities are that we're studying. So one way that you might try to fill in that gap is with the story about emergent particles. Okay. Well, fundamentally what there are are fields, but I'll give you this story about how from those fundamental fields emerge something like particle phenomena. Um, similarly, you might take um, the machinery of the classical limit where you go from quantum field theory into its classical analog, and that kind of fits with this um, emergent story of saying how maybe classically in that kind of framework, we can recover some part of the like behavior. Or maybe you give um, the kind of Holverson and Clifton line that says, well, you know, really the, the foundations is what's got it right. That's, that's what's right. And everything we're saying up here, the talk about particles is just a useful fiction. You demote the particle language. All right, so there's just some ways you might fill the gap. Um, but today, I want to actually just close that gap and say that we were we were misguided, at least on the counting problem, to generate such a big dis, uh, disagreement. So the plan for today is to reassess the counting problem for interacting quantum field theory. When we look at this counting problem, initially it looks like the upshot is that in the interacting quantum field theory case, we're not able to build up the technical machinery we need to be able to count individual particle states. And so we're missing out on that second component of the minimal particle conception that they can be counted and aggregated. 
you don't have the technical machinery in your theory to do the counting, then um, you've violated that condition for your particle conception that we need for that particle interpretation. Okay, so it looks like the upshot is we don't have resource or recourse to that kind of machinery, um, and therefore there are no particles. But what I want to say today um, is that there are two major interpretive components at stake here. The first is the ontology. What, what are the things that will interact? But then there's the second component that really needs to be taken into account, which is the nature of the physical process. What even is it for two things, whatever they are, particles or fields or anything else? What is it for those two things to interact? And I think what's gone on in the literature is that we've overlooked um, some very important pieces of answering that second that second component, saying what that physical process is, what the interaction even amounts to. And so what I'll do in this talk is give you a new minimal conception, not just of particles, but of interacting particles. What is the standard we should be going for? In the interacting case, it's different than in the free case. We have to take the, the um, interactions into account in a serious way. And that moves the bar. It changes what we should be looking for in our technical machinery. Um, and then I'll, I'll argue that this new minimal conception of the interacting particles is not susceptible to the counting problem. All right. So that's the goal. And here is the roadmap. Um, that was the introduction, so I'll read up to part one. Uh, next, I'll move along to uh, recounting Doreen Frazier's argument and um, giving us a little bit more of a handle on how this counting problem gets generated in interacting quantum field theory to begin with. And once that problem is clear, um, I'll then turn to why, if all of that goes through, it would generate this big gap. So in section three, we'll talk about um, how it is that at the level of modeling and of experiment, we really do count. It's a really important process in both the modeling at the theory level and in the experimental level. We, the counting is there in a really important way in several places. That's what I'll talk about in, in section three. And so putting two and three together, we'll see that um, if the counting problem gets off the ground, that does generate this really big gap between the models and the experiment and then the foundations of quantum field theory. Um, but then in section four, I'll argue that once we take the nature of interactions into account in a more significant way, that will actually close the gap. So with that, let's uh, see what this counting problem is all about. So I'm sure there are a handful of folks in this audience who are um, <clears throat> perhaps more familiar with some of these technical details than they would like. We'll um, go through them at as uh, quick a pace as possible without um, missing things that are really, really essential. So here's how, here's how it goes. <clears throat> we start again with the free case of quantum field theory, the easy case where these fields are not interacting with each other. They're just hanging out. And in that case, it turns out that free quantum field theory does admit of a particle interpretation. And so um, how, how does that work? Well, choose one species of particle. Maybe it's whatever your favorite particle is. Maybe it's an electron, maybe it's a tau on, but fix one species. Um, then its state space is some concrete Hilbert space H. So for a given species, there's some concrete mathematical Hilbert space that we would use to describe that particular particle. And for a different species, we use a different Hilbert space. So fix a space H. Okay. Now we're going to build this thing F of H that's called a Fox, a Fox space. So what we do with Fox space is we say, well, just the one H works if I have one particle. But if I have two, well, then I'll need two of those H's tensored together. And then instead, if I have three particles, 
Well, I want to tensor together three of them over here. And so what Fox space does is it takes the direct sum of each of those multi-particle states. So um, here with just the complex numbers, that's when you have no particles. You have uh, no particles, then one, then two to three, and so on. So um, I have more details to, to it than that, but from just this, this so far, it should be very clear that as we're constructing this space, the goal is to be able to count numbers of particles. That's sort of baked into it. It's all about counting. Okay. When you go through all the details of constructing this in the appropriate mathematical way, it turns out that one of the things you can do on this space is construct this capital N, which we interpret as a total number operator. So you give me a state in Fox space, I construct my number operator and hit that space with my number operator, and it returns to me some value, zero, one, two, three, so on. And I get to say, aha, that number N that it gave to me is the correct number for saying how many particles are in fact in that state. So we interpret N as assigning a definite, definite number of particles to the state of our field. And the, the just real upshot here is that this box space construction um, is well known to give us the technical machinery we need for aggregating and counting. And everyone agrees about that. So box space is the right technical machinery for getting a particle interpretation, um, especially because it gives us this total number operator and it's nice and definite. Um, this is uh, a definition of box space that comes from Laura Ritchie's book. And I, we won't go through all the details here. What I just wanna highlight is that baked into this definition um, is this reference to building up uh, using these other creation and annihilation operators. We use these to determine this total number operator. And I just wanna highlight the sense in which getting that total number operator is a key piece of what a Fox space does. <laughs> what you want as a total number operator, Fox space is your guy. Go build yourself a Fox space. All right. And as um, Dorian Fraser puts it, a Fox representation supports a quanta interpretation or a particle interpretation. Why? Well, because the eigenvectors of N, that total number operator, possess properties that are appropriate for states containing definite numbers of particles. So uh, what we should be taking away from this is this recognition of a certain kind of requirement um, that we have to get a particle interpretation that fits with that minimal conception of what a particle is. Here's the requirement. To get a particle interpretation, we must have the technical machinery to assign a definite number of particles to a given state. All right. Again, it's about counting in an, in an unambiguous way. All right, so all of that works, again, in the three cases. If you've got three quantum field theory, all is well. You can interpret your states of your fields as having a definite number of particles. The trouble is when you move to the interacting case. So can Fox space, can we generate Fox space for an interacting quantum field theory? And the answer is no. And here's Fraser's argument. Well, suppose we could. Suppose we could do it. Then, um, the Fox space for your free field theory, subscript F is for free, um, and then the Fox space for the interacting theory would have to be equivalent in an appropriate sense. And here's the appropriate sense. Um, you would need this kind of unitary operator taking you from one Fox space to the other. And you would need for this equivalence to hold at all times t, at all times t. Um, the trouble is that Hogg's theorem that you can prove in, in quantum field theory, it's got uh, the wonderful logical status of a theorem. Um, it shows you that this operator u of t doesn't exist at any time. It tells you this construction um, when F sub I really is for interactions is impossible. Another way of putting the result of Hogg's theorem is that it says, if you try to do this, 
you will find that the thing you wanted to be interacting is in fact still free, and that you don't actually have any interaction. All right, so the upshot is, in this most straightforward way of just trying to make Fox space work for the interacting case, it fails because of Pock's theorem. You can't do it. I wanna highlight here that uh, conceptually, this issue of whether or not you can get something, some equivalence to hold at all times is a key, key part of, of the argument. Um, and you, you find this uh, throughout the literature on, on these issues about particle interpretation. So here's um, <clears throat> Laura Ritchie with her book describing um, not just the ring argument, but a few other of these issues about can we get a particle interpretation? Um, here's, here's what she says. To look at bubble chamber photograph, that like blue photograph we saw earlier on, um, or find the diagrams and see particles is so natural as to be almost irresistible. It just seems like the right thing to say. Explanations of a certain sort, um, explanations of a certain sort implicit in this way of seeing particle invoking explanations. I will suppose that whatever other features these explanations exhibit, the particle notion they invoke is meant to apply not just at one point in time, but it's meant to apply over the entire micro history of a particle physics experiment. So it's again, this issue of, we want it to be the same at all times. Uh, the notion of a particle you're getting should apply to the particles entering the apparatus, to the interacting particles evidently depicted in Feynman diagrams, to the particles exiting the apparatus whose ionization trails are recorded in cloud and bubble chamber photographs. So there's a lot there, but the key takeaway here is again, that it, within all of these discussions, um, the idea that to get your particle notion uh, in a way that's gonna be satisfactory, it had better apply throughout the entire interaction. If you've got one particle notion for your incoming states, and a different one for the ones that are interacting, and yet a third particle notion for the ones that are outgoing, um, most people would say, you've cheated particle interpret interpreter. You really need to, um, to succeed at your goal. You need just one notion of a particle that applies across the entire interaction. So with that, we might revise our definite number requirement uh, to be stated as follows. get a particle interpretation, we must have the technical machinery to assign a definite number of particles throughout the entire micro history of a particle physics experiment. It's cheating if you can only get it to work at one point in time. Okay. So with that, um, let me kind of restate the overview of Doreen Fraser's argument against particles on the basis of this counting problem. So again, we start with the uncontroversial claim that free quantum field theory has recourse to Fox space um, and that Fox space gives us the right technical machinery to um, succeed at that definite number requirement. Then the question is, can we extend that construction to the interacting case? And uh, Frazier goes through three different attempts to do that. The most straightforward one fails. Um, and then there are two additional attempts that kind of adjust the strategy in a little ways. We'll skip this for time. Um, but she argues that both of those attempts fail as well. Okay. So what's the upshot here? The upshot is this counting problem, which uh, is that there's no way to furnish interacting quantum field theory with the conceptual resources of Fox space. There are technical problems with trying to actually construct Fox space once you're in interacting quantum field theory. And moreover, Fox space is the technical machinery that gives us a particle interpretation. And so interacting quantum field theory does not admit of a particle ontology. Okay, so that's our counting problem. Um, so now we go back to our little picture of the house of particle physics. What do we have? Well, we have down here at the foundations in quantum field theory, 
the upshot of this counting problem is that um, counting particles in the interacting case isn't feasible. You can't do it. You don't have the right technical machinery. So no counting particles. But up here, as I'll uh, go through in a minute, both at the experimental level and at this modeling level, counting particles is a really core um, part of, of the practice of science here. And so that generates this gap um, that we've got to be able to say something about. And again, just to highlight how this is really about the world and not just future as a model or something, here's um, how Granger uh, didn't use the paper. Since in quantum field theory, there's no known alternative for establishing that a free or interacting system exhibits particle-like properties. We don't have an alternative to clock space. This is the only thing we've got. Um, this would seem to be a fatal blow to the project of interpreting any realistic physical system which is bound to interact in terms of particle-like entities. So again, well, what we really want to be able to understand are the realistic physical systems, um, and they don't just sit there and do nothing, right? They, they're always interacting. So since those are the relevant cases and the associated theoretical apparatus to describe those realistic cases doesn't have particle ontology, we're going to make this big conclusion that then those physically realistic systems don't actually have any particles. Okay. So therein lies the problem. We'll now turn to looking at the um, role that counting plays in both experimental physics and in theoretical particle physics, sorry, experimental particle physics and in theoretical particle physics, not at the level of the quantum field theoretic foundations, but at the level of the modeling practices that go on um, using the specific quantum fields, the three specific quantum field theories that make up the standard model. To get started with that, I'm going to say a couple preliminary remarks about these things called Feynman diagrams. This is a, a generic Feynman diagram. And what you're supposed to read here with the convention that time flows from left to right is that this is depicting a process where you got two particles coming in. They annihilate. You get a virtual photon here, maybe, and then two new um, fermionic particles leave and off they go their separate ways. So um, when you first encounter these diagrams in a quantum field theory class or in a textbook, you will immediately be told, don't take this especially serious, right? Um, this, you shouldn't think of this as like a picture of what in fact happens. But they have this more sort of instrumentalist kind of status. At least that's what you're initially told. Um, furthermore, what you find as you continue in these courses is that you write down one of these diagrams that gives you a sense of just what goes in and what comes out for one of these interaction processes. Um, and it's, it's not just showing you what goes in and what goes out. What it is, is it's uh, the sort of thing you put into an equation. So if you've got this generic decay process here. So we've got something coming here, something happens at this gray blob, and then two things come out at the end. What this, um, what this is, is this expression for a series of terms that you would sum up to give you a value for the um, amplitude of that process actually happening. So what's the likelihood that you've got this thing coming in, whatever it is, and then it decays to these two other things, well, you would calculate that amplitude by um, completing this process over here. And so the diagrams over here on the right-hand side are shorthand for um, complicated mathematical expressions that you would want to, that you would learn how to fill out in a, in a quantum field theory class. So um, we've got, okay, and these can be very complicated. Just wanna kind of highlight the, the degree of 
complexity that can happen here on the right hand side. So what's happening here on the right hand side in general is that you've got a perturbative expansion and the diagrams that correspond to individual terms are shorthand for how you should go calculate those individual terms. The diagrams on the right hand side are not ontologically the sort of thing you want to take seriously. They correspond to terms in a perturbative expansion. In contrast, the ones on the left hand side name a physical process. They're giving you information over here about the types of particles that come in and the types of particles that go out. So there's something a little bit more substantial about what's going on on the left hand side. We want to take those a little bit more seriously. Um, so as another example for uh, let me back up a second. So what I want to say is that there are these two different functions for Feynman diagrams um, that might not be immediately clear when you're first told, don't take these things seriously. They're calculational devices. Um, the vast majority of them are that. They're calculational devices. And you want to be very careful about drawing deep ontological conclusions about them. But there is this second role that the ones on the left-hand side play which is the naming of the different physical processes. And I think Feynman diagrams, when they're in that sort of role, should be taken more seriously. Okay, so an example of that sort of more serious role um, is when we use them to depict different ways of generating a particular outcome. So for example, what we have here are four very different processes that all have in common the production of a Higgs boson. So here in the red is one way to get a Higgs, this H0. Here in the green is a different way to get a Higgs. Here in the blue is still another, and here in the purple is yet another way to get a Higgs boson. So each of these are the sort of diagram that you could then stick an equal sign on uh, next to and fill out the perturbative expansion that corresponds to calculating those. Um, but what's important here is that we use these diagrams to say something about different physical processes that we think really, in fact, happen in the world. We think there really is a, a difference between generating a Higgs in this gluon fusion process versus the, the Z fusion process. So I want to suggest we should take Feynman diagrams used in this role more seriously. So we've got these two different roles. On the left-hand side, we're naming a physical process. Um, and the differences between different physical processes matter. And those uh, diagrams capture some of those differences in important ways. But then on the right-hand side, those things are shorthands for terms in our expansion. All right. So with that preparation on Feynman diagrams behind us, we're ready to see why it is that counting particles is such an important part of the practice of particle physics at the level of models and at the level of experiments. Okay. So first at the level of um, the models, there's a very basic sense in which counting is here that's um, really straightforward, really straightforward. So what we have here are diagrams depicting two uh, general types of processes. So on the left, we've got a decay type process. So think of this as naming a general class of processes where you start with some A type particle, it comes in at some point, it decays into a B type particle and a C type particle. Now, anytime you're gonna name that kind of decay process, in a very sort of basic and not particularly interesting manner, you're counting incoming and outgoing states, right? There's one here, and then at the outgoing set, we've got two. A very basic sense in which we're counting. All right, but beyond that extraordinarily basic sense, counting plays a more substantial role in this area of modeling um, that I want to illustrate with these two processes in particular. What we have in these two diagrams um, are two processes that are sort of mirror images of each other. So here on the left, we've got a pair of, of leptons, say an electron and a positron. 
they come in, they annihilate each other, turn into a virtual photon or maybe a Z boson, which then decays into a quark anti quark pair. And then on the right hand side, we've got the reverse process where instead we start with a quark anti quark pair in the red here, then they annihilate each other, generating a virtual photon or Z boson. And then at the end of that process, that decays off into another lepton pair, an electron and a positron, say. Right? So both of these are um, physically allowed processes. They happen in nature, they're the reverse of each other. Because of this symmetry, right, this sort of reversal, when you go to actually calculate these amplitudes, um, they're basically the same, except for some really interesting features about these quarks. So what happens over here on this hadronic Z decay process is that the amplitude here turns out to be proportional to the number of colors that these quarks can come in, where the interpretation of this result that is proportional to the number of colors is this. If you've got a process that can go into a, say, an up quark and a down quark, there are as many different ways for that to happen as there are colors for those quarks to be in. So it could decay into quarks, the quark and the anti-quark being red and anti-red, or it could decay into the quarks being blue and anti-blue, or it could decay into the quarks being green and anti-green. Those are your three possibilities as regimented by the properties of those particles. So we get this direct proportionality to the number of the colors. In this reverse process, we instead get a suppression uh, of, of it um, inversely proportional to the number of colors. And the interpretation here is, well, to get this process to actually happen, you would need to have your up quark coming in, coming in here, match up with a um, up anti quark in the appropriate color state. So if you've got a red quark coming in here, it's got to happen to meet up with an anti red quark rather than an anti blue or an anti green. And so what's the what are the odds that that's going to happen? That they'll just happen to align in just the right way? Well, it's a third because right? more often. Um, they'll be uh, not matching colors. Okay. So what does all of this have to do with counting? What I want to claim here is that we are counting the possibilities of what could happen here at the end um, in accordance with the properties of these final, final state particles. And we're counting in a pretty fine-grained way counting up what's possible in this fine-grained way according to those properties. And similarly over here, we're counting up the, the different ways in which this process could actually get off the ground or the ways in which it wouldn't get off the ground on the basis of the properties of these individual particles. And so it's not just that we count, you know, in this process, you've got two coming in and you've got two coming out. We count in this more fine-grained way too. And what are the ways in which we could get these final states or these incoming states. And that matters. It matters for how we actually get the right theoretical values. It makes a big difference in our predictions. Here you get the suppression on the basis of, of uh, the, the counting of the colors that are possible. Okay, so that's um, how it works in the modeling case. Counting is this key. Uh, key conceptual step um, in getting our calculations off the ground. On the experimental side, um, I want to say that counting is also extraordinarily important. The way experimental particle physics works um, at a very broad kind of basic level is that you take your beams of particles you accelerate them to a very high energy and you smash them into each other. And that generates tremendous amounts of additional particle shrapnel. And it's those final states at the end of the explosion that happens that get detected at the edge of uh, your detector. 
And so the data we're generating in these kinds of experiments um, gives the signature of the final states in some complicated process. So maybe you had a couple of protons smash into each other, a whole bunch of intervening particle states occur, and then some final states actually get detected over at the end. Um, and whatever else is happening in experimental particle physics, we are definitely counting up individual instances of particle signatures. You can't make sense of the tremendous amount of statistical analysis that goes on in experimental particle physics and maintain that counting isn't a thing they're doing. It's a very basic part of how the inferential structure works. Um, it's also really important at the interface between the theory and the experiment here. So for example, um, what we have here is a plot of uh, branching ratio of different ways in which a Higgs boson can decay into other particles. Down here on the x-axis, we have the theoretical value of the mass of the Higgs. Um, so this plot is generated um, at the level of modeling in the theory. Um, <clears throat> and so what it says is that um, if the mass of the Higgs were much smaller, say down here at 100 GeV, the proportion of the times that the Higgs would decay into this BB bar channel is much, 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 much higher than any of the other channels, the other types of things that a Higgs could decay into. Whereas if the value of the mass of the Higgs were much, much higher, say up here at 200, well, then the proportion of the BB bar channel following this curve down would be much, much lower. And instead, these two other, the green and the blue channels, would predominate. Okay, so the point here is that these colorful lines are generated by theory and they're giving you these branching ratios. So um, you've got your Higgs, you let many, many, many different Higgs decay, you know, millions and millions of times. And you ask what's the proportion um, within those different decay events of the different products that a Higgs can go into your theory gives you this plot of where those ratios would fall as a function of the mass of the Higgs. This is where we interface with the experiment and start to narrow things down into getting a result that tells you what the mass of the Higgs in fact is. So this blue uh, shaded out region here was ruled out by some earlier experiments. And then this other side was also ruled out by some experiments where experimentally we've looked through the data of how often we see these channels and we've seen well the proportionality doesn't match the theory there so we rule it out right and so this is how we whittle down to saying well the higgs if it exists had better be in here okay so what i what i claim here is that the um use of these branching ratios here in this way at the interface of theory and experiment requires some notion of counting in a really important way. If you bite the bullet and say, well, we're not actually counting at all, um, then it's going to be very hard to make sense of the inferential process that's going on here. So pictorially, what it looks like we have going on here um, <laughs> is that the experimental level and the modeling level say we're counting particles, we're counting particles, we're counting particles. Uh, skip that for now. Um, but down here at the foundations of the theory, it's saying, no, 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 you can't count particles. Um, <clears throat> and I want to just highlight the sense in which if this gap really is there, it would be a big problem. The gap would be big. Um, so I think it ties into some themes that we see in the localization literature as well. So here's what Jeff Barrett says, uh, again, hinting at this, not hinting at, directly calling out the measurement problem that's always going to rear its ugly head. So here's what Barrett says. One of the features of our world is that we have determinate measurement records. We perform experiments, record the results, then compare these results against the predictions of our physical theories. 
Measurement records then sh should somehow show up in the ontology that we associate with our best physical theory. Indeed, if not for the existence of such records, it would be difficult to account for the possibility of empirical science at all. So I take it that what Barrett is saying here is that um, <clears throat> if you wade into the measurement problem and accept the idea that our best physical theory is saying, we don't have a way of accounting for determinate measurement records, you're gonna be stuck with this very difficult problem of trying to account for the possibility of empirical science at all. How did we get empirical science off the ground at all? I wanna say similarly, if not for the existence of measurement records of particle detection where we're counting particles, it would be difficult to account for the actuality of particle physics at all. So if there's this gap here, it's a big one. All right, so to recap, we've gone through um, a little bit of the argument uh, for how Fox Space gives you the right technical machinery for getting a particle interpretation because it lets you count. Interacting quantum field theory doesn't have recourse to that machinery of Fox Space. So interacting quantum field theory doesn't have the right structure for counting. And therefore, right, because you can't count, um, interacting quantum field theory does not admit of a particle interpretation. But it's very hard to see how we can account for theoretical and experimental particle physics without recourse to counting and aggregating. And thus, this counting gap between Q of T and particle physics is big. All right. So here's the here's where I think things have gone wrong. It's at this stage here, when we um, accept that not having recourse to Fox space pushes you to this conclusion that interacting quantum field theory can't have a particle interpretation. So what's gone amiss at at that step? Here's what I think has gone wrong. There are these two interpretive components at stake. One is the ontology. What are the things that interact? But then there is this issue of the nature of the physical process itself. What is it for two things, whatever they are, to interact? I want to claim that when we start to take those interactions much more seriously, we fill out the answer to the question, what is the nature of the phys physical process that is an interaction? What we'll find is that the de definite number requirement for a particle interpretation is no longer reasonable. Once you start to see what the, the nature of an interaction is supposed to be, you'll very quickly see, okay, expecting a particle interpretation to give me a definite number of particles at all times was the wrong bar to set in the first place. And without that, the counting problem dissolves. All right, so with uh, the time remaining, we'll try to say a little bit about why um, <clears throat> Things change when we take interactions more seriously. All right. <clears throat> so what I want to um, do here is go give you a first, give you a minimal conception of what an interaction is, analogous to that minimal conception of a particle that we started with, and then show that once we take that minimal minimal conception on board, that will close the counting gap. All right, so to say a little bit about um, what interactions are and what our minimal conception of those what our minimal conception of them should be, will appeal to some pretty pictures that we've seen before and not try to take on anything new. <clears throat> so recall that uh, in this set of pretty pictures, what we had, uh, what we have are four different physical processes for ways to generate a Higgs boson. So these are the, the types of Feynman diagrams that go on that left-hand side of the equation that I said we should take more seriously. One of the key functions of these diagrams is to name and distinguish and categorize distinct physical processes. The differences between them really, really matter. 
Um, and one of the things you'll, once we sort of take that into account, what, what should we, what should we observe about interactions on the basis of these examples of physical processes that are interactions? Well, first of all, in say this red one, notice that the number of incoming particles and outgoing particles changes, right? We start with two and we end up with one. Also notice that in general, the type of particle changes as well. In none of these processes, do you start with a Higgs and also get a Higgs out? In all of these processes, you start with something different, a gluon or a quark or something, um, and you end up with something different, including um, a Higgs. All right. So very generally, we again have this picture of general types of um, interaction processes. You can have here on the left a decay process where you start with one particle and you end up with two. Or you can have this kind of annihilation process where you start with um, two A-type particles and you get out two B-type particles. Um, but, but notice this. In general, when you have an interaction, the number of particles can change and the species of particle can change. So at a minimum, a minimal conception of an interaction should account for both of those things. You can change um, particle species, go from gluons to a Higgs, for instance, and you can change particle number. I want to emphasize how um, how important this is. So I wonder if JP could give me a hand and just do a high five for me. All right, high five. So this was a nice, very pleasant social interaction, right? One of the many, uh, I think, good features of the type of interaction that a high five is is that JP and I can go our separate ways and neither of us are fundamentally changed, okay, right? <laughs> Nothing's, no additional people have been created or destroyed in this social interaction. <laughs> Particle interactions are not like that. Particle interactions are these wildly creative <laughs> and destructive processes. If you've got an actual interaction happening, do not expect, expect for the end result to be anything like what initially went in. Big substantive changes happen here. And once you start to accept that, you're gonna to start to think, ah, maybe for an interacting quantum field theory to get a particle interpretation, I don't want my ingoing states and my outgoing states to be unitarily equivalent. I really want them to be unitarily and equivalent. Okay. So, so much for our, um, so hopefully at this point, you're just on board with the idea that for an interaction, we really want to be able to account for these two things, change in particle species and a change in particle number. You might then wonder since we're, you know, saying from the outset, what we want to do is interpretation sort of work. Um, can we say much more about what an interaction really is? Can we say more about, well, what happens in those intervening states? What really happens physically between having your ingoing states and your outgoing states? Um, and I want to suggest that you, at this stage, probably can't say much more. First of all, on the basis of experiment, um, it's definitely not the case that what we're doing in experimental particle physics, sort of setting up a, a video camera and watching exactly what happens, right? This is a beautiful artist rendering of what kind of maybe happens, um, but what we get from the data are, again, just those signatures of final states in the shrapnel. And what we then have to do is reconstruct, well, here's what sort of intervening states must have or most likely were there in order to generate that final um, final data. So experiments aren't giving us a lot of insight into the nature of an interaction itself. It gives us a lot of information about outgoing and ingoing states. Okay. Similarly, when we get to the level of modeling, theoretical modeling, um, what can we say about interactions? Well, we can say things um, about various conservation laws that they have to obey. Um, we can say general things like heavier particles decay into lighter ones and not vice versa. Um, and there are other such statements about what's possible or 
impossible for combinations of ingoing and outgoing states. But in general, um, <clears throat> all of these collections of statements from the standard model theory uh, that can serve as an auspicious basis for interpretation, they're really all about patterns among incoming and outgoing states, and they're not about the intervening ones. Right, what we can say about interactions are what's allowed here to match up over here. And again, when we get to the, the details of the intervening states, what we have are just kind of the, the calculational devices. Okay. Um, as another challenge from the, the deeper levels of quantum field theory, if you wanted to try to say, well, what really happens in an interaction, you're going to very quickly come against this problem of having a variety of approaches to scattering theory. Here are three of them. We won't go through the details, um, but I, I think if uh, you start to go try to say, well, what does quantum field theory tell me an interaction is? To get started, you're gonna have to pick one of these approaches to scattering theory. And on the basis of each one, you're most likely gonna get a very different story about what an interaction really is. To make things more complicated, we've also got some other kind of calculational wizardry happening in lattice QCD. I think that's not going to be a place where we're going to very easily read off some kind of um, clear picture of what an interaction is. Okay. I think in the interest of time, um, I will move along here and if you're very curious to hear about um, why in more detail uh, box space probably isn't the right structure to um, capture um, <clears throat> interactions according to this minimal conception we can we can go through that in the q a um, but let me uh, just sum up here okay so what what have we done over lunch today together We've reassessed the counting problem for interacting QFT uh, and identified two major interpretive components that are at stake here. First, there's the ontology, just what are the things that are interacting? But then second, there's this issue of the physical process. What in fact is it for two things? Whatever they are, particles or fields or something else, what even is it for those two things or more to interact? And uh, taking that second, component um, into account in a very serious way, giving you this updated minimal conception of interacting particles. I got skipped up, let me just, ah, here's, here's, here it is, I'm getting a two now. Um, so we said at the outset that uh, for our minimal conception of particles, they're the sorts of things that can be localized and counted and aggregated. So I revise that and say, that all applies just fine for free particles. They're not, not doing anything. Over here in the interacting case though, here's what we wanna be able to say instead. Interacting particles are susceptible to creation and annihilation through interactions. They can be counted and aggregated just fine before and after an interaction, um, but you needn't really say more about what happens during an interaction. And you certainly don't, shouldn't be incumbent upon the particle interpreter to be able to give a definite number of particles at the moment of interaction. That would be asking too much. Okay. And so under this updated minimal conception, uh, that counting problem dissolves and the gap that the problem created gets closed. Thank you very much. <laughs>